David, are you there? I'm here. Hey. 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 Oh, my wow. <laughs> David, how are you? Good. Nice to, nice to see you guys. I mean, yeah. I am so excited to see you. This is an amusing idea. Talking, <laughs> talk, talk about, talking about turning back the clock 100 uh, years. Right? How many, you guys probably know how many years it is. How many years? 29. Is 29 years. Good God. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know. I mean, I think one of the things that's um, so like one of the reasons I'm so excited to see you and you would have no unless somebody's told you, you would not know this. But, um, you know, I've I've directed now almost 30 episodes of of children's TV. Oh, and any time I get asked what it was that made me want to be a director I always refer to you because when I think about what I love so much about directing children, especially because I do mostly children's TV, I think of the way that you and Jeff McCracken uh, treated us as kids and how much respect you had for us. And you were truthfully the first person to really give me an acting lesson. Like I learned <laughs> so much from you. I, I couldn't even tell you how much I learned from you. And so your um, impact on my life in the two years that I knew you 27 to 29 years ago uh, has literally just changed the course of my life. And I, I've never really been able to properly thank you for that. So I'm super excited to say that to you. Well, thank you for doing it. I'm glad. You know, better to be a good influence than a bad. <laughs> we've had Absolutely. those too. Yeah, we've had, we've, <laughs> yeah, we've had those too. <laughs> and directing young actors is a particular subset of directing. You know, I mean, it's not exact. It, it's in many ways like directing anybody, and and other ways, it's got its own particularity. Yeah, well, that is actually a, a great question to start with then. I mean, you had, a re you, I don't know exactly where you started your directing career, but you were most famous for directing Designing Women from 1989 to 92, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, before that, I was a theater director um, and before that, a playwright. So the, so the roots are in the theater and then came to Los Angeles to direct one episode of Designing Women and stayed for four years and became one of the producers and so that was the that was sort of the beginning. But I want to go back for a second because I'm fascinated by the fact that it, you came from theater and so did Michael Jacobs. And I think we we tend to forget how much multi-camera sitcom in particular was like a direct descendant of theater and how much uh, what we do as actors and as directors in that the, that context is pretty much theater. I mean, was that an easy transition for you or or can you talk about what that was like to go? Because you used to I, I know you used to do Shakespeare because you you gave me and Ben an amazing Shakespeare lesson one day. I don't know if you remember this, but we, we spent like one time reading. So I know you went, I, but I know you were a cl you started in classical theater and then here you are doing a kid's sitcom. Can you talk about how similar or different they are? Well, you know, I think you're absolutely right the, that the multiple camera television comes from the theater. And my conviction is that it comes from, from vaudeville. Yeah. But vaudeville shows had these short plays between the musical acts. And it gave them, a, you know, it, it, it was uh, my set. I mean, I never, it was before my time, but I screwed right. up. Like this. There'd be these, a, a, a single set would be inserted in the middle, you know, in the middle of the stage and a, a, a little play of 20 minutes or so would take place. And, and I've read some of them and they're remarkably like what we end up doing. So I think that what, what multiple camera did was take take the theater and 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 add to it the resources of movies and and specifically of television because of Desi Arnaz, and so it has a lot to do it has a lot to do with the theater. I mean, almost entirely. So the transition is not that hard. Uh, actually. Did you watch a lot of television before you started directing it? No, not particularly. Uh, you know, the the way I actually specifically came to it was. I directed a play on Broadway that came and played the Anson. And when it played the Anson, you know, I had directed seven plays in a year and a half and had less money at the end of it. Than, <laughs> anyway, but, you know, the logical extension of this is Potter's Field someday, you know. So this is not, you're not going to 
direction. And I was very fortunate. You know, I directed good things in good places, but it's a, it's and it is what it is. So I took the opportunity of being in Los Angeles and having my name in the newspaper every day because there's a big ads every day for this boy. Uh, so I didn't have to explain why I was there. I didn't come as a supplicant or a beggar. Right. And, and sort of poked around and figured out how to do it. And then Jim Burroughs, whom I met, arranged for me to to, to observe Bill Persky doing Kate Nally in New York. So that was where I lived in New York. And so I sort of made that. I took the money I made at the office and basically invested in myself. I didn't work for spitball a year. But I had the money. I mean, I knew I had the money from the Amazon. So it was a sort of investment in the future that was un- unclear whether it would work out, but then it did. And then, and then designing women, you know, with the, the women were, if I understand it correctly, it's a little secondhand, sort of. The women were looking for what they called a real director. Uh-huh. Uh, I know. So, a, you know, a smart agent, Wayne Morris said, to Harry Johnson, I got this guy. And I my understanding is also he said if you don't hire him, somebody else will and you'll regret it. Right. So Harry and I had a long talk on the phone and he hired me. I mean, we never even met. So when I showed up at Warner Brothers, I had never seen that was designing when it shot on film. I had never seen a camera up close. I'd oh seen it across the street in New York, you know, when you <laughs> walk in the streets in New York. And now you're in charge of four of them. <laughs> That's a camera. No, I see what they're doing. You know, so it was it was like coming in virtually with a blank mind, but with but, but understanding actors and stage right. and stuff like that. And then so you go from there. And so, so that, you know, you directed the first two seasons of Boy Meets World almost exclusively. John Tracy did the pilot and then you came in and did every other episode for the first two seasons. Yeah. Did you one? What was were we your first experience working then with? kids and what was that like well you guys were great and fun i mean i remember certain kinds of specifics and presumably we'll get into this like danielle how we got to you yeah <laughs> oh, i can't wait for that story oh, yes. can't wait for that story and just leave fortuitous I mean, I think we could actually get into it here instead of when we talk about the episode. There'll okay. be a lot of other things to talk about the episode. Yeah. Um, let's talk about how I became Topanga because I actually just learned something from David for when it, when I was trying to get David to come on the show and we were emailing back and forth. David said to me, yes, of course. How could I forget that Friday night? Michael had gone home. Michael Jacobs had gone home for Shabbat yeah. and the actress we had hired as Topanga was not working out. So for those who don't know, I had auditioned for the role of Topanga and I did not even get a call back. And I know exactly why, because I had zero idea what acting was. And <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> all I had done up until that point were commercials where all I was doing was playing a cute bubbly 10 or 11 year old. And I had done two episodes of Full House where, again, I was just kind of playing a slightly different version of myself. It was just the tiniest bit different. And I didn't know that you could change how you said things <laughs> or that you could pretend to be Think someone. About why you're saying something. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that at all. Truthfully, I did not know that. I was, I, I had had no training at all. And but you were cast in the episode. You yeah. had one of those. You were one, one of those, those girls, right? I mean, yes. when I look at the episode, right, they're the girls who are doing the science experiment. Yeah. Yes. And the girls who are talking about Corey's, well, what we yeah, think yeah. is Corey's here. Yeah, yeah, that's my recollection. You were one of those. You were the yeah, fish so, girl, weren't exactly. you? Exactly, yeah, yes, yep. I was the fish girl. You were the, the fish girl. girl pulled out the dead skeleton <laughs> yeah. fish. Oh you were the fish girl. So I, I didn't get a call back for Topanga, but the next day I got the audition to be one of those two girls, and I booked that role. And so then I got to set, and I was one of the girls who had a couple lines, the fish girl, and I saw David working with the actress they had cast 
cast as Topanga. Now, I was not there for all of the Topanga scenes Mm -hmm. because if my character wasn't in the scene, I was in school or something. But in the couple of scenes where Topanga and Fish Girl were together, I got to watch David work with her. And I it was literally the first light bulb of what we were doing as actors went off in my head where I was like, Oh, wow. (laughs) And I had that feeling you get as a kid where you're like, can I can I try again? Like, I really feel like I get it now. And David was working with her. And I specifically remember uh, one line that I don't think was in the episode where when she walks away, she says peace. And um the actress. Wh- I remember her- this. Oh, That's wait, right. I remember this whole moment. Yes, That's this right. Moment was legend- it was just yeah. a moment that really stuck out because I remember it being repeated over and over again. Her natural in- inclination was to say peace and walk away. And, and David was saying, it's it, when you say it like that, it sounds down or sad. It's not. It's it's just peace. And <laughs> and I right. remember them going back and forth. Peace. Peace. That's right. Peace. And being like, oh, man, in my head, I'm hearing myself say it going. I, I can do this. I know. I think I <laughs> yeah, know. She could I, know. Adjust. I remember that. I remember yeah. that Friday rehearsal. It was this. The, the, the whole episode was a disaster at that point. <laughs> yeah. It was. And, it was, and it was day one. Yeah. yeah. And so. And for the record, the, the girl's name is not actually Fish Girl. Just so we know, no, there's a, no. she, she's got a. <laughs> her probably, it was Marla Sokoloff, who we know and love. Probably yes. very lost in the midst. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Her name was wow. Megan Parlor. Megan Parlor. Okay, there we go. Um, but so anyway, long story short, uh, Friday, the very first day, that actress who's playing Topanga gets let go, and I'm gonna then let David take it because now this is stuff I don't have the inside knowledge on, but David does. David, what happened? This is what I think happened. Okay. There's sort of problems that you think you can solve. And then there's problems that you think you can't solve. And sort of by working with her, she moved from one camp to the other camp, to the insoluble camp. So Michael had gone home. I mean, the way things worked in those days, you guys can remember it's better than I do. We had a table reading on Friday. You can bank school hours on Friday. So you guys all went to school. And then late in the afternoon, you got out of school and we rehearsed. But by then, if it was sundown or close to it, Michael went home. He'd done the rewriting and he went home for Shabbat. So the, basically, in that situation, I was on stage and Ed and John were the guys upstairs. And, Ed Dector and Ed Dector and John. Dector and John. Just were, were the guys upstairs, sort of in lieu of Michael. So I remember calling them, I think, and saying, eh, disaster we got to get rid of her and <laughs> yeah, they said oh what what are we going to do and i said no 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 we got her where is she here i i've seen her R- right so that's what i recollect yeah. thinking was no this i this, I, I got we i don't mean i got this but we got this we got this and my again i think maybe they came down and maybe you did part of the scene or all the scene. Oh no, I know That's exactly what, I what happened there. You guys did a reading. Yeah, it was it was you yeah, and Marla. Did, and John had said Yes. Yes. I mean, it was self-evident that you were great. So and, that and, okay. So that's the, the that's some of the holes that are filling in for me now because we definitely did an audition at the end of the rehearsal day. They yeah. said, Marla, Danielle, we ne- can you guys come with us and we're going to have you read these this scene. I don't remember what scene it was, right? But it all of a sudden it was apparent that Marla and I were re-auditioning for this other character, which um, is also an, a kind of an uncomfortable situation because Marla and I have spent all day kind of being pals and buds and the two of us are here, you know, we're friends, we're playing these scenes together where we play friends and now all of a sudden it's like we're both auditioning for a it's much bigger... Right? Exactly. I mean, it's like thousands of times for you guys. A hundred percent. And yeah. so I, Marla went in first and Marla did the scene and my mom and I are sitting outside and we can hear laughing going on, oh, talking going Going on and I'm looking down at the scene being like laughing I don't I don't know that there are there is there a okay I guess there's a laugh like I'm stressed Marla is going is in there she's in there for a while it's very talky talky and friendly and I can just hear a lot of chatter and then Marla comes out and Sally Steiner the casting director follows her out and in front of us Sally is asking for Marla's mom 
every possible way she can get in touch with Marla over the weekend. Because Marla was going up north, which I think is where she lived. She was Uh going back up north to see her family for the weekend. And Sally was nervous, like, how are we going to get in touch with you? This is before the days of cell phones. So I need to have the house number where you live, your agent's man, your agent's pager number, your man. I need every, because we're going to call you over the weekend. And if, and if you have to come in on Monday, I need to let you know over this weekend. And I was thinking, okay, that audition went really well. And now Danielle Fischel. And now go ahead, come on in, Danielle. Ladies and gentlemen, Danielle Fischel. And I walked oh, in and I did worst. the scene and then... I was done. There was no like extended chatter. I walked out and like turned around to see if Sally was following behind me. No <laughs> one followed uh, behind me. I've written down my numbers in case you need to get in touch with me over the no weekend. No one. Do you need my fax machine? Anybody? No. Here's my pager number, my mom's pager number. It that- was crickets. <laughs> and I then, my mom and I walked out and I burst into tears. Oh no. I was like, I didn't do it. I didn't nail it. It was, I don't know what happened. I just, obviously Marla was better because I, I, they wanted, they, it was clearly they want her and I was sad and I was like, but it's going to be okay. I didn't, you know, an hour ago, this part wasn't mine either. Like, you know, who cares? It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And my mom, it's now two hours past the time we're supposed to be home. And my dad has no idea where we are. He's been paging my mother, like nine one one, like, where are you? And so my mom says, we need to call your father. And we had a Zach Morris car phone. Yes. So I call my father on the Zach Morris car phone and I am in tears and I'm trying to explain to him what happened. So we were rehearsing and there's this girl and then <laughs> and then so Marla and I and he's like, what? He's like trying to understand what I'm saying. Like, why? The, what are you even talking about? And then he goes, hold on, hold on. Sorry, I have a call waiting. And he just comes back and I look at my mom. I'm like, call waiting, <laughs> holding the phone <laughs> like this. And then my dad comes back and says, uh, that was someone named Sally Steiner, and she told you to come back on Monday as Topanga? None of these things are words my dad had any idea what they meant. He didn't know who Sally Steiner was. He had never heard the name Topanga. He didn't understand what was going on. Wow. And I just scream. Ah! And my mom looks at me, and I go, I got it, Sally Steiner. We just start screaming in the car. That's cool. It was, I mean, it will. it is a moment I will... Remember, I get chills thinking about it. I remember, I will remember it for the rest of my life. It it's changed they everything. Couldn't, they couldn't find Marla's number. <laughs> it, it's so, what's so funny is that it was a huge deal to you because being the guest star in a leading role was a big deal. But Actually, it didn't mean that much. It does, you know, now it, it means everything. It changed your life. Oh, right? sure. Yeah. But actually, from the perspective of, of like, you know, if 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 it had, I mean, Topanga was supposed to be a one one episode. Yeah. Right. It was supposed you to went just from be a three great lines part to thirty lines. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like that's it. It was like right. So it's so funny that it only it's like snowballed. You know, throughout the years. So this moment, which was a big deal for an eleven yeah. year old, but like yeah. actually, if your life had gone on and departed, you know, whatever, it probably would have just faded away and been one of those fun like childhood memories. But now it's become this defining characteristic of your life. It's fascinating that's how it works though the that's how life works the only thing i would not because i agree with that yeah but when a, a writer like michael writes a part like that where there's a connection yeah implicitly there's a hope that it goes on right yeah My, right. i don't think so, so that from your point of view i mean i think every step of the way it's like you're the fish girl, then you're auditioning, then you're good, happy, then you're sad, then you're happy again, right? Right, yep. mm-hmm. that's the secret. <laughs> and, and if it ends there, it's like, but but from, from the show's point of view, there's always about a, a short-term storytelling and a longer-term storytelling. So I think there was, it was important that the right person be cast in that part from the show's point of view or else you would have to redo you had to find another way to introduce Corey to somebody who's going to be in, in his way right. yeah so i think it's two things it's unimportant or or important only in retrospect and at the time really important well that's actually yeah. really that's a good question do you ha- do you have any memories of what what i mean do you because at that point the show is still defining itself. The show is still trying to find its voice in a lot of ways. And had you, when when you took the job to direct the first season, I'm presuming you had seen the pilot. 
Yep. And that's why you took the job. What was no, it? No, it's more complicated. I mean, I took the job because, you know, it's not worth going into all the details, but <laughs> my, my, Michael had wanted, Michael and I had a prior relationship on another show. And and then Blooming's World was, I was supposed to, you know, Michael wanted me to do the pilot and then I did something else and the other thing fell through and some John <laughs> took on. It's like, I mean, believe me, there's a whole sort of like, story upon story. second, yeah, second story podcast not, doesn't have any bearing on anything, okay right? well then i guess the question becomes what do you do you remember being a part of developing the voice of boy meets world or developing the tone and and do you remember what those conversations were like like did did it feel like the show was sort of baked into the pilot and into the writing or were you still kind of fishing around for a character like topanga a best friend like sean you know finding the the parents yeah. I, mean, I think those things are they are the thing that boy meets world had from the beginning and i, I was trying to remember I, parenthetically i was trying to think how many shows i did with michael jacobs and i would say okay it's three. Oh wait there's another four. Oh wait there's another six. like six the, the, conceivably seven things i did with michael over a period of say four years boy meets world was a perfect expression of Michael's voice. And yeah. that was dead. So the thing was pitch perfect from the beginning because of the connection between Michael as a writer and a voice and, and, and Ben as an actor and a yeah. speaker. Yeah. So the rest of it fell in around, the, you know, it felt it fell in, okay, you know? Yeah. I don't remember. I mean, I remember being, Michael's not an eat. Hey, you guys are wrong. So Michael's not a day at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the kind of day. Yeah, it's, it's not. So, so it's not like it was smooth, and no new show is ever smooth. And Michael makes things harder sometimes than they have to be. At the same time, this was great. I mean, it was like when a writer has a speaker. The Michael Ben connection. You, you, you've got yourself from the basis of real success. And everything else falls in that way. And I mean, I think going back to Danielle, to you, Danielle, you know that in so many ways it was evident. And I think it was evident to me, even when that other girl was still there and I was thinking, I can't, I'm not going to be able to make her right. But this one, this one with the fish, she seems good. <laughs> you know, is you can sort of feel what will go. You can feel what will work. Well, going back to what you said about the roller coaster of, you know, you're happy, you're sad, you're happy, you're sad. After I get that phone call on Friday night, yay, I got the part. Show back up on Monday as Topanga. I did. I showed up on Monday as Topanga and I was now the person David was working with trying to get the, you know, the right tone, the right intonation, the right deliveries, the right physicality. And it was hard for me. I was a bubbly, fast talking, spunky. You talk uh, so fast. I, I you were what, 11? I was 12. 12 years old. Yeah. And, I mean, okay. and uh, yeah, I, I, it was very hard to speak slowly. It's still hard for me to talk slowly. <laughs> and we worked all day. And then we do, as we've discussed on the podcast before, what our weeks were like. Monday was producer run through at the end of the night. And David, I, I would love to remember, love to know what your memory of this night is, because I can tell you my memory was that we we do the producer run through and we sit down for Michael's marathon note session. And I had uh, I had never been a part of his marathon note sessions. This was my very first one because it was my very first week. And uh, Michael starts off the notes by saying, um, Danielle, I'm going to have to I'm going to give you your notes all in one time at the end. Uh, and I'm going to give everyone else their notes now, because if I made everyone sit here through all of the notes I have for you, we would all be here for hours and no one would ever get to go home. So you're just going to wait for the end. Oh, welcome to the I show. Say right there, there's the problem. Uh, <laughs> 
great. And I and I remember think I remember like from that moment on, my eyes welled up because you know I'm mm. on us. I'm now in front of everybody, everybody, all the producers, all the writers, all the cast, and all eyes are on me for a second. And then he just quickly moved on. And for the rest, for maybe the next hour, while he did go through page one, line one, notes for everyone else, I have tears in my eyes. Like, okay, I don't know what's coming for me, but it's not going to be good. And then after he did everyone else's notes, he called my mom down. My mom had been sitting in the stands, like where the studio audience sits, um, alone. And she came down and he sat us down at the Matthews family kitchen table and literally opened up the script and went through every single one of my lines and what he wanted and what I wasn't doing right and how slow I needed to talk. And I don't remember if you were there for, I I don't know, remember if you stuck around for that or if you weren't there, I, I was like laser focused on my script and I can see, by the way, I'm sorry. I can see this still affects you. Oh yeah, like, no, I can see I, just sitting I, here next I'm to you. I'm sweating profusely see, right now as we can, talk about it. Still, it still affects you. Well, I because the that. other thing that Michael said in front of everybody, and maybe it wasn't in front of everybody, maybe it was just to my mom and I. But what I know specifically was said was, uh, all I know is if you don't come back tomorrow doing this entirely differently, you are also not going to be here. Referencing yeah. the girl who was replaced. Okay. I worked for Michael for four years. Okay. In multiple films. This is a hateful story. Huh. I used to drive to work and go past that Bob Hope park. And many days I wanted to stop and throw up. Mm. Yeah. Because of how unpleasant it was to do with yeah. And how, I mean, there's many wonderful things about him. And, you know, I mean, believe me, there's many wonderful things. But there's hateful things. Uh-huh. This is one. Yeah. And this, it's like to hear this, you're sweating. I'm pissed. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm really pissed. And it's enough to make me want to like sign off from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to be associated with anything of that guy's. No, so, no. I, I, yeah. I because mean, this I, is just not how you, this is, you know. Yeah. Great. I'm glad it became a hit with, you know, I'm glad of everything like this, but this is. But it, yeah. what I will say is, and I agree with you, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not deflecting from that, but I did go home that night with my mom and my mom and I stayed up until probably three or four o'clock in the morning going over every single line. My mom would just, cause I, I wanted to make sure I had it. And it was my mom saying to me, slower, slower, yeah, slower and going, okay, okay, okay. And so the next day I showed up and it's Tuesday and I rehearse again all day with David. And again, I always felt so safe with you. I knew you had well, my Well, that's back. one of the things, again, let me say, everybody who worked with Michael understood implicitly or explicitly, okay? whenever Michael lurched to one side of the boat, everybody went to the other side to keep it from Yes. Him. Yes. Yeah. But yep. the job was, it's why I hated it, ultimately. I mean, you can put this on the radio. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> is the job was to do your job, right? Whatever that was. But also to prevent swamping and drowning, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, go on. So, Tuesday, we do <laughs> our network run through. And so I, again. Started, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> can, wait, wait, before we jump to that, can I ask you a, qu- a very quick question? The night, yeah. it's three o'clock in the morning, you're studying with your mom. Are, yeah. are you doing this from a, a place now of, God, I really want to get this right? Or are you doing this from a place based in fear? I really wanted to get it right. I am a type A perfectionist sure. and I always have been. And so. Right, but what does getting it right mean yeah. in this context? Getting that's it what right means that, making, making Michael happy. Michael happy. That's yes. what it meant. And that's, that's, what that's it meant. the problem that's there to me. Me and too. And that's what me I, too. you know, f- that's what I remember feeling. And that's what I don't think is healthy. And I don't Agreed. think that that's. Let that's me tell you a story. This is one. I mean, because, you know, in anticipation of coming in here, sort of things come back into your head. So I did a show, Michael. It basically acts as a ventriloquist and yes. actors as things who voice whatever Mike like like a puppet, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's it. That's the that's Michael's reality. And that's the reason I say Ben is so important in this is because Michael Ben was perfect, perfect. And when I watched the episode, I thought Ben is amazing. Yeah, he's phenomenal. He carried the whole show. <laughs> An astounding yeah. representation of that world and that material. And stuff like yeah. That. But I did a show with Michael, with Marie Osmond, 
and Betty White mm-hmm. and Craig Ferguson. She's and, what I cast. Yeah, right. And it was, it was not a successful show because, again, Michael's voice is My Two Dads and Boy Meets World, and Betty White and Marie Osmond are from <laughs> basically another solar system, let alone. <laughs> yeah. Right? But I remember this because this is when I thought, I got to go out of here. I can't deal with this anymore. Betty was doing something, and Betty and I became really good friends over time. And I worked with her multiple times, and I adored her. She was doing something, she was doing something, and it wasn't the way Michael. And Michael said to me, have her do it like Florence Stanley. Now, I don't know if you guys know who Florence Stanley is. Florence Stanley, I think, was the mother or the grandmother on My Two Dads. But she was basically a perfect representative of Michael's voice and the antithesis of Betty White. But Michael, he couldn't take someone else's voice and uh-huh. take what was good at it. He said, have her do it like Florence Stanley. No, tell her to do it like Florence Stanley, was what he said. Well, I didn't tell her. <laughs> I walk up to her, talk about something else, come back. Right. <laughs> you know, it's great services today. Okay, exactly. just smile and nod. Exactly. <laughs> but that's how, that's your experience of three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. The yeah. equivalent of being told, do it what Florence did. Yeah. And he had a, he had a very direct, a very, very precise vision for what he wanted. And there was very, there was this very small margin of error outside of that, that he was willing to let anybody play. And that's, you know, I mean, that's fine. It's his show. It's his, it's his uh-huh. brainchild. But so we do the, network run through and all I want all I want all day is you know I don't see Michael during the day Michael's not on set while we're rehearsing so I don't see Michael at all and all I all I want is approval I want Michael's specifically Michael's approval because I had lost it the day before and also because he threatened to fire correct I did not want to lose the job it's do it exactly the way I want it and do it that exactly the way I want it tomorrow or you're not here Exactly. Yeah, right. I have the power. Yeah. So, yeah. And I had already well, seen yeah, that happen. Relax and have fun. Yeah. Well, you are 12. Right. It's time to learn that lesson. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So I, we, do yeah. the, we do the network run through. We sit down for the note session. And again, I'm sweating profusely and I have no idea what's coming. And Michael says this time, Danielle. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he stands up and all the writers stand up alongside him. And he says, oh, the, the let's, big show. let's give Danielle a round of applause. You know, you did exactly what I asked of you. Thank you. Thank you. It was, you, you know, congratulations. It was wonderful. He gave me some praise about specific things. And then he just started notes. And I then got to sit in on a normal note session. And yeah, there were still notes for me, but it was, you know, there were no more threats of being fired. It was like, okay, I had, I had done the work. I had shown him I was worthy. And then <laughs> the next day we were, we were taping. But that's, I mean, that's exactly, he's, I mean, he, not to harp on this, but he set it up in such a way for now when he gives you the standing ovation, it's like the sun is shining yeah. on you. Like, that's- I can't look at, look what I, I've done it. I've made him feel so good. It had nothing to do with your acting or anything. It's just make Michael well, and feel I good. And I will not lie that it then totally sets up that you go after that every week yep. you're chasing the dragon of michael approval you're yeah. you every week you're like wow that was su- that was such a high the next week i'm gonna go after that and if you don't get it you're you feel a little like uh you know i didn't i didn't hear that i was bad but i also didn't hear that i was good like yeah. I, I you don't hear anything thinks. sometimes hear anything. And it's yeah. like yeah what does that mean i didn't hear anything good or bad i want to point something out that's interesting you guys were all kids Michael couldn't pull this stuff with adults. Yeah, no. no. We couldn't pull this stuff with people who weren't not yet secure in their, right. own, in their own world. Right, yeah. I mean, I think the most, the one of the most damaging parts is creative too, which is that I remember this sensation of the show is either working, the episode's working, or it's not, it's falling apart. And in my mind, that was something definable and concrete that everybody could see and that everybody knew or did not know. In retrospect, that was whatever Michael had written that week and whatever he wanted it to be. Right. And that's a huge distinction because as an actor, the worst thing you can do to approach material is think that there's a pre-existing perfection that you need to like reach up for. 
that 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 takes away your agency that takes away your creativity that removes you from the process and it was something i didn't learn until my 20s when i actually had to learn how to act and realize like oh what we were doing was not acting what we were doing was what you were saying it would be sort of this puppetry this you know showing up and 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 creatively i feel like it it stunted me incredibly because it it didn't allow me the creative joy of discovery and experimentation and recognition that there is no right or wrong in art. There's just what we want to make as a team, as a collaborative, you know, exercise together. Uh, and we never had that atmosphere on set. We, I never had that sensation, and especially as a kid. You just feel like, oh, we're, we're missing something. Somebody's going to get fired if something's not right or if we don't make this one person happy. And in my mind, it wasn't, you know, wasn't even always conscious that it was one person because you have an entire system of people enabling that, you know, working to keep that power dynamic in place. And that's why I appreciated the directors, you, Jeff McCracken, Oh, you know, name your director that we had, but especially in those early years, because you guys always let us know that we were creative individuals with our own input. And I know that you were in a tough position, but it was exactly why I wanted to direct on Girl Meets World. And that's what I sort of wanted to crack open for those kids was to was to sort of say to them, like, hey, you get to make your own choices here. You know, like the, acting is is a creative endeavor that you bring. It's, it's not better. just it's better. Yeah. And pe people have as you used a good word, where their agency is engaged. Yeah. But of course. Going to what you were saying, though, about Ryder saying, you know, kind of letting us do our own thing and, uh, you know, supporting us in doing our own thing and, and encouraging us to do our own thing. You, I was in a strange position when the show started, right around these episodes, because it was, there was kind of, we always talk about the two Boy Meets Worlds. And there was kind of the, the Boy Meets World that was happening in the school where you're now introducing Topanga. Sean is starting to get a little bit more of a voice. Corey's there, who's just like a tiny little stand-up comedian who is carrying the show and is hitting beats that are well beyond his age that I'm noticing now as an adult where I'm just going, how did he put, he's, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal yeah. and really carried the show. And then you had the family dynamic, which was the parents' relationship with Corey, his relationship with them, and then Morgan and Eric would come in and say like a funny line here or there and leave. So I was kind of like floating around at this point. And I remember having a conversation with you and it was one of the brief ones because again, I had no character really. And they didn't know what Eric was going to do or was going to become. And it was this moment where it was, it's what every actor kind of needs to hear where we were having a talk about that where I said, well, you know, I'm just kind of coming in and saying a line and not really establishing anything. And you looked at me and said, that's why you got to make it count. And you turn and you walked away. <laughs> and it's that mo and it's that exact moment I remember of, hey, if I have one line, I'm going to get the biggest laugh of the show because then next show I'm going to have two. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was that kind of those little acting gems you would throw out occasionally just like, well, all right, you got one line, make it count. And you turn and walked away. Yeah. And it was that kind of little thing. Those are the things that stick with an actor. It's not the, the, I don't remember the three hour note sessions. I remember the length of the sessions, but I don't remember what was actually imparted, any of the wisdom that was imparted. Yeah. But really? the little, that's not so really, funny. no. Well, but see, those I think little you older, moments, man. I, that's I think, what I, I mean, were, I was floating. Yeah, you were older and you were more secure and you were coming in, you know, as a professional actor should, which is, I've only got two lines, I'm going to make them count. And you are able to scaffold your way up to the character and to the part in 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 a conversation a healthy creative conversation with the writing staff right where you're like they write a couple of jokes for you you come in you do your thing the audience responds next week they add more yeah. and then you add more and then you add more and you can see that that's how eric became yeah the entire comic relief of boy meets world which is wonderful but you know that it was in a healthy creative uh, yeah. conversation you know it was. i i don't think that for danielle and i or you know i i'll speak for myself i didn't have that same sort of creative conversation i felt like i I was living up to uh, someone else's expectations yeah. and needing to match them uh, in the dramatic sphere. I, I less so because, you know, and I think that's where I ended up thriving on the show as a more of a dramatic actor, because I kind of tapped out of the comedy by season three. Like, and I think we'll <laughs> see as we're watching. I think I just gave up because I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. Like, I'm not that, you know, I just, I wasn't as interested in it, first of all, but I also didn't want to compete in that field, you know, and it just was like, no. Whereas on the drama side, I felt much more comfortable. I felt like I could own it 
it more. I felt like mine uh, in a way because it was somewhat unexpected. And I don't think it was, you know, as 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 built into the sitcom form. Yeah. So I could sort of do my own thing. I mean, yeah, the best part, the best moments in Boy Meets World are funny, but they're not necessarily jokes, although, frankly, they're all jokes. Right. It's all, right. But, but, but jokes can be better or worse delivered. They, they can be detonated in a certain way or not. Dramatic stuff doesn't detonate that way. It's, yeah, something, right. it's arrived at differently and rendered differently. So that, that is a place where it's really hard to say. I mean, you could say something stupid like cry now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I've so, got, so very quickly, I've got a very funny David Trainer story because yeah. I was thinking to myself, like, what sticks out in my head? And here's one of my favorites. We're doing a family scene in the kitchen. And Lily, like they, her, Lily's on running gag was loving something and then throwing it away. Yeah. <laughs> like where it's like, I love this. And then they chuck it away. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't getting it right. She had a doll. It was, it was not this episode. It was a later episode, but she had a doll where she has to come down. I love this doll and throw it away. And she wasn't throwing it right. <laughs> David, you're getting a little more frustrated, a little more frustrated. So finally you go, Lily, it's not that hard. You just do this. And you picked up the doll and you threw it right through the window. <laughs> oh, I remember that. <laughs> Are you serious? It smashed right through the window in like the actually kitchen broke seat. The like actually no, through yeah, the yeah. glass. I remember that. <laughs> That's amazing. Like right through the thing. Right oh through the thing. It was God. just right through the And we all lost it. The, everybody on the set was laughing yeah. hysterically as he's like, it's not that hard. You just do this and smashes it right through the glass. <laughs> right. It's like this six foot four. How tall are you, David? Like towering over the six <laughs> foot. I mean, she came, came, basically came up to my kneecap and she <laughs> painted the whole thing. I, mean, I don't know if you jump ahead to this to the, you know, to the end of the season. Michael in his imperial capacity, but I, I don't blame him. These things came out before the show with the act, actors had all been introduced. So Michael came out and said, I'm, you know, we're so pleased you're here tonight to the audience. And I just want to, you know, we've been picked up for another season. And every, you know, we all cheered and clapped and were excited. And whatever her name is, Lily. Lily. No. <laughs> she just starts screaming. I don't want to do this. I don't I remember that so this. well. You know what? That was actually that was actually the back nine. It was our back it was nine. The, yeah, up. it was when we were taping the thirteenth episode. And we got the back nine, and Michael announced it in front of the audience, and Lily just started bawling. I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so sucks. that's the downside of children. You know, Danielle, you talk about you, and clearly all three of you how to feeling for wanting to be performers and how to be performers on your own terms and how to relate to the needs, the, the demands that are made of you. She didn't want to do it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. No. She, yeah, that was, and not, I that was not shows, that. actually when you watch it, I think, who is that? What's, wait a minute. What little thing just walked on there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I feel bad. I know. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, we, I'd love to, I wish, I would we hope love, we have her I hope, on it, I'd yeah. love to have her on to talk about her memories and her, her thoughts on it. She's wonderful and doing very well. And, she is. She's, um, she's great. She's got a beautiful she's baby. It, yeah. She's doing great. Um, so David, why did you not direct any more after season two? Where did you go? What was, what's the situation? Why didn't we see more of you? You know, we, I think I came back once or twice and did yeah. like, sort of like pop in and do, because yeah. it was fun to see you guys and fun to come back. I, my recollect, I had done, Michael did a show before Boy Meets World called Where I Live with Dougie Duck. And I directed most of that. And that, like, got 12 episodes and canceled, something like that. Although it was a lot of fun to do. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then after Boy Meets World, I, we did another show or other shows. Like, that might have been Betty White and, and, mm. and Marie Osmond after that. So I sort of moved on, and then we did we did another show called. You could tell this was a disaster in the making. Misery loves company. That sounds like a hit, doesn't it? I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of the there was this wonderful guy who worked for Michael over the years with Michael over the years named Bob Young. Oh, Bob's yes, great. We love Bob. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredibly gifted, funny, gracious. He just heavenly guy. Yeah. You know, and, and we were get preparing to do a pilot. I mean, I really I remember this vividly sitting in Michael's office at Disney, in the animation at Disney. And we were casting and we were doing some of this. And, and Bob Young said in this wonderful, faux, plaintive voice, 
oh, Michael, just once, can't we try to be successful? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the misery loves company. That's Michael thinks, right? That I don't know that that's what Bob was addressing, but it was like that, like right. one of these really misbegotten ideas that Michael was convinced was the right thing. <laughs> Burmese world, you know, Burmese world, however, uh, however, was a was a very successful mix of elements. For yeah. Michael. That's the reason it's such a big success, and that's the reason it's re- watched and remembered. Yeah, and happened. you went on to direct. Every single episode of that seventy show. Seventy show. Which Wait, and that's, I was thinking about that when we were talking about you because those those guys when we started were a little older than you guys were. They were sort of or mid late teens. I think Mila yeah. was fifteen because I remember going to Mila's sixteenth birthday party. So I know I know she was fifteen. You understand? But which is older than twelve. I mean, it's yes, yes. yeah, a big difference. Yeah, yeah. 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 she'd acted a lot as a okay. but. That was so freeing. Those guys were so inventive, and the and the way we worked, we were left alone and, and did it. And they they brought some. The characters became them, and they became the characters. I mean, the whole thing. And the writers, you know, the way I was thinking, writer, you were saying something before, which I think is really true. That the, in an ideal world, a week of rehearsal on a multiple camera comedy is a conversation. The writers write a script. The actors rehearse, then they show it, then the writers respond, then the actors respond to what the writers do. And this conversation goes on back and forth until Friday night, or in the case of Glenn's World, Thursday night. And then it's done. The conversation's over when you've shot it. And then you start to, another conversation the next yeah. week. Yeah. 70s show was eight years of really engaging, interesting, fun conversations. Oh, right? mm. Every That's week. amazing. And and we got so we could do that show. And we, we pre-shot some stuff, but we do we were doing two and a half hours. Started at six thirty, be done. Oh, done by oh my night. gosh! And, wow. You know, we, we, we do things twice and move on. Maybe pick up a line, but everybody everybody was like, so the freedom to be themselves and then to be remarkable. So I I look at that, even though it's different in some respects because of the age difference. It's still about kids right and mm-hmm. so it was just an antithetical experience and heaven really well look how successful most of the cast has been after the show i mean i think a lot yeah. of that also <laughs> comes from having that kind of environment to grow as an actor to yeah. where then you you have a love of uh, of the craft and you want to go on and pursue it where a lot of us when we finish boy we're like i'm done for a little while <laughs> um and i think that's a, there's a big difference i mean yeah truly well they had and you guys were, I think that's right. You know, that you, you whatever great gifts, because you look at the show now and you, I see the gifts that you guys brought to you. You come away and think, oh, this, this was not fun, right? No, no, it was not fun. Well, 70 show was a blast. <laughs> complete. Times didn't work hard times, and there were shows that didn't work. I mean, you know, it's like everything. You do sure. three episodes; they're not all bliss, but overall, heaven. And I don't think that any of you would say that about Boy Meets World. Yeah, I got, I got a little, I got away with it a little more. I had a little more of the freedom. I was kind of left alone a little bit more, which gave me a little more love of the the genre than I think the younger cast was who I think were beaten up a little more than I was. I mean, there were times where I just kind of slid under the radar and would do what I wanted to do. And, yeah. and you guys would be kind of battered a little bit. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's uh, different experiences on different sets, I guess I, would be how you well, I, 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 I know some guys who are talking about their sons who were good baseball players in, in high school and, you know, come up towards college and come up towards, with sort of verging on being able to be professional baseball players. And they would have a high school coach that would beat the love of the game out. Yeah. By the time they got out of high school, they didn't want to play baseball. I have yeah. two friends that had that happen, where the, where the kids were really good and the coach over stressed them. Yep. They just said, not playing. Yeah. It, it's so, when I hear those stories, I'm so sad. 
Do you have a favorite episode looking back? Have you, wa- first of all, have you watched, other than us asking you to, to rewatch episode number 104 for us, have you ever watched an other, another episode? Do you remember any other episodes? Do you have a favorite? No, I remember, because I haven't really watched it. I don't really watch stuff. I mean, I, I don't even really watch that 70s show. Once in a while, I mean, I remember going to a gym where, where it was on sometimes. The Cindy <laughs> Fisher so I'd look up and say, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> that was mine. Go back that to was me. But, but I, I really go back and watch it. That's why I liked, I liked watching the episode that we, we all watched here. What I remember is basically tropes, setups, things, like the classroom or the bedroom or the... You know, you remember that kind of stuff because half-hour comedies like this are made up of recognizable elements that are assembled differently every week, right? The character elements are different and the, and the scenic or the storytelling elements are different. But it's like, I mean, I, this is a ridiculous analogy, so forgive me, but it's like classical ballet. There's five steps, right? That's it. There's five steps. Look what you can do with five steps. Yeah, yeah, they say exactly. they say the blues is three chords, but some people can play it really, really well. Did you keep in touch with anyone, producers, writers? Are you in touch with Michael? Is there anybody you kept no, in touch no, with from? Oh, no, no, <laughs> no. no. Uh, David Kendall. Yes. And Bob, over the years, David Kendall, a divine again, like. Uh, Here's this in- interesting thing. Michael attracted really good people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like t- and they ended up hating, right? <laughs> or thereabouts. But, but they were like David Kendall and, and John, you know? Yeah. yeah. Strauss, great. God. You yeah, David, David Kendall and I still have a great relationship. He's, he's a Kendall wonderful guy. One of the best guys. Yeah. Funny, smart, yeah. nice, talented great guy. I, when I started directing, I shadowed Kendall. And it was, it was crazy. Yeah. It was like, man, look at us 30 years later. Yeah. <laughs> he's such a good guy. But he's great. And, and, and Bob Young, just stupendously great guy. Yeah. And, and sort of, again, what's interesting about very – accomplished and and high people with high standards but temperamentally relaxed i mean i think of myself i don't know whether i'm temperamentally relaxed or not but i wasn't relaxed around michael i was throwing up in bob hope park but but, <laughs> but basically the, michael picked people to work with him who would go to the other side of the boat yeah who understood that balancing so they're wonderful guys. I mean, David Kendall is a prince. Do you? Uh, quick question. Do you remember working with April Kelly? Yes, dimly. You know, you know, she got marginalized as a voice quite early. What a surprise! Based on, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and then I think by the second year she was had withdrawn. Had yeah. withdrawn because I think it was. Who knows? That's above my. Well, she's listed as a writer on both this episode, 104, that we're going to talk about next, yeah. and 103 that yeah. we talked about last week. We had uh, Bill and Bonnie on, and she's listed as a writer in both of those, and both of those episodes are incredible. They're great. Um, They're great. Yeah. And so it is such a shame that she didn't stick around and didn't, you know, get to do more because. Uh, and never saw her again, by the way. Never. I know. Nothing. Season one. So I, she was only disappeared. For the first yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. disappeared. Yeah, and I think it was probably, there was no room for another voice in that position. Can't right. have two generals in that room. Yeah, and 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 so she had to be gotten rid. But so she's like she's like our JD Salinger though. Like, wh- where is she in the world? We, I we know. should make a mission of this podcast to track her down. I would I mean, love we that. Should. God knows should. what she remembers and what she would. You know, and it's, yeah. it's like I'm still whatever I've said in this podcast. I'm still holding back. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm yeah. editing like crazy as I go along. But wow. You know, but there wasn't room for another. There wasn't room right. for another voice, and it's it's sort of undignified. I yeah, think, yeah. To be mm-hmm. co-creator, and then to be treated like a cast off. Is it? Are you speaking? Oh, yikes! Yeah. Yikes. Well. Ah, uh, I, coming up next. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say it's hard. It's It was really hard to be a, a girl and a woman in um in that environment for yeah I think that is a very democratic way of saying yeah yeah it's it was and you, know, you know something and here's what's important to remember the president of michael's company those days was dawn turnowski a woman of tremendous accomplishment yeah right? mm. and, and, and smart and i mean d- did for michael held the business held that dysfunctional part of Michael's universe held it together, and she became, you know, the head of he, head of the CW. She's a major yep. figure at Spotify. She's really smart and nice and great. And she, so in a funny way, Michael, it's not an environment for women, and yet there was somebody absolutely central to the thing. Yes, who, who was Dawn? Yes, I remember Dawn. She was. I remember her being ridiculously smart. Yeah. Susan Jansen was another yes. one I remember being a yes. Harvard grad. Right, and I gotta say, tough. You, yeah. you, you know, t- and, and pe- I say tough with admiration. Yeah. You know, with a with a, a willingness and ability to, to take yeah. it, whatever it was. Yeah, it's like when people say, "I'm," you're just so resilient, and you know they mean it as a compliment, and yet really how you feel is, "I wish I didn't have to be so resilient." I wish I weren't yeah. passive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, coming up next, we are going to recap episode number 104, Corey's Alternative Friends. We're going to walk through um, so many memories, including how I came up with the choreography for the famous donut in the sky dance while also being terrified (laughs) that I was going to get fired. Uh, (laughs) So that'll that'll be fun. And uh, David is sticking around. So join us for episode, the next episode 104, Corey's Alternative Friends, where David Trainer joins us to talk about the episode. First time we see Topanga. That's right. First time we see Topanga. You can't, Mm -hmm. amazing, amazing. I can't wait. (laughs) And the first time we meet my sister Stacy, guys. And is it also the The last time? Legendary (laughs) Stacy. Everybody's favorite. Mentioned again. Well, I was going to say it's also the last time we meet <laughs> your sister, Stacy. First and last Stacy <laughs> reference. Oh awesome. man! All right. Don't forget, you can follow us on Pod Meets World Show on Instagram, and also uh, be sure to email us your thoughts, your opinions, what you want to hear more of, things you love, things you don't love. You can email us at Pod Meets World Show at gmail We love you all. Pod dismissed. Pod Meets World is an iHeart podcast produced and hosted by Daniel Fischel, Will Friedle, and Ryder Strong. Executive producers, Jensen Karp and Amy Sugarman. Executive in charge of production, Danielle Romo. Producer and editor, Tara Sudbach. Producer, Lorraine Vurez. Engineer and Boy Meets World superfan, Easton Allen. Our theme song is by Kyle Morton of Typhoon. Follow us on Instagram at Pod Meets World Show or email us at podmeetsworldshow at gmail.com. 